The gravity of the time is such that every new avenue of peace, no matter how dimly discernible, should be explored. Never before in history has so much hope for so many people been gathered together in a single organization. You will provide a great share of the wisdom, of the courage, and the faith which can bring to this world lasting peace for all nations and happiness and well-being for all men. Laura Holgate, thank you so much for having me down to the headquarters of the Nuclear Threat Initiative, where you're the VP for Materials Risk Management. And uh, <laughs> this probably goes without saying, but also formerly the U.S. Ambassador to the International Atomics Energy Agency, and I can't wait to talk about that position. It's great to be with you, Brad. Yeah. Let's first get started, though, with how you entered this line of work to begin with. I know 1983 was a pivotal year. <laughs> yeah, it really, for me, started um, with the movie, the made-for-TV movie called The Day After, uh, that depicted the day after a nuclear attack. And they, uh, they chose as the target of that attack Lawrence, Kansas, which was just a few miles where, where, from where I grew up. Wow. And so even though I knew it was just a story, uh, it was extra compelling to me. It, it worried a lot of people. It, I mean, for that generation, it was kind of like the War of the Worlds and yeah. Orson Welles back in the, back in the day. But um, it really got the attention of the public uh, about the risks of nuclear war and the challenges that that, that creates for the United States. Um, I was a freshman uh, at college, my, uh, my first time away for that long a, a period of time, and so it, it hit me, you know, even more hard that I wasn't there at home yeah. to see with my own eyes that, you know, my house hadn't been, you know, incinerated <laughs> and my family was still there. So. And what were you studying um, at the time? Well, I knew I wanted to to, to do international relations of some yeah. nature, and yeah. you know, even before seeing the movie, I, you know, kind of had this idea that the. The U.S. Soviet, you know, battle for global dominance was the big international question of the time, and yeah. so I arrived on campus thinking that I wanted to be a Sovietologist, and so I. A started, Sovietologist. Yeah, uh, I started taking Russian um, language, and and I took some Soviet foreign policy, Soviet politics classes, and I did terrible in all of them. <laughs> I was kicked out of Russian class, and um, decided, well, you know, the Sovietology stuff isn't obviously for me, so. I'm going to shift a, a couple steps to the side and, and broaden my focus to international relations more broadly, looking at how do you end wars, what what causes terrorism, yeah. circa you know 1980s terrorism, which is a very different kind of terrorism, um, and you know kind of the big picture around international relations. And, and where where was this? This was at Princeton University. This is at Princeton, and then you went on to get your master's as well. And what mm -hmm. was that in? So I, I did a master's at MIT in uh, what they called at the time Defense and Arms Control Studies. It's now mm. the Security Studies Program. Um, but it was like the perfect degree for someone who wanted to go to Washington and save the world, which is what I wanted to do. Yeah. But all the advice I'd gotten was that I needed a master's degree to, to do that. That was the price of entry. And so to find a program that had courses on exactly the things that I wanted to teach or w wanted to learn about. Yeah. Um, so take eight courses, write a thesis, uh, and you're done in two years. Um, so that was a, a great program. I got to learn about you know, the budget battles at the Pentagon, and I got to learn about the history of arms control, and I wrote a thesis on the U.S. chemical weapons destruction program and the tensions that that created with the arms control peace community and the environmentalist community, and very fascinating uh, set of, of research there. So it was, a, it was really a, a great time to you know, really dig in and pack my brain full of useful knowledge. And your expertise really has, I mean, it, it, a great extent into not only the nuclear side, but also biological and chemical. But how did you arrive on nuclear being a, a topic that you were going to focus on? Um, 
Well, it was it was still fairly general in the national security field when I went when I finished my master's degree. And I mean, again, late eighties, the you know the the nuclear standoff, early nineties, the nuclear standoff was between the U.S. and the Soviet Union was still a critical uh, piece of our international politics. Um, and but I started working as a you know, essentially an administrative assistant at what is now the Belfer Center uh, for Science and International Affairs at Harvard's Kennedy School. Mm. Um, and at that time it was led, at, as it is now, um, by Ash Carter. And the some of the work that they were doing, he and Bill Perry, who was at that time at Stanford, uh, were, were watching, I mean, we were all watching the Soviet Union, you know, kind of stumble towards what would be a collapse, but of course we didn't know for sure that that was going to be a full collapse and but they started thinking about you know what happens if it does collapse wow. and what does that mean for the weapons of mass destruction wow. that are there and the and kind of laying the intellectual groundwork for the the question you know for for recognizing that the nuclear threat the WMD threat uh, from the Soviet Union weapons of mass destruction the weapons of mass destruction threat from the yeah. Soviet U Union was going to be more about their weakness than about their strength, if that whole you know Soviet glue <laughs> comes Come apart, yeah. and that that meant we needed to think about not confrontation but cooperation as a tool to manage that challenge. And I was part of the research team, the you know the very most junior part <laughs> of the research team, working on you know how do we create this idea of reducing the weapons of mass destruction threat in a cooperative way. And so what was the thinking and, at that time? Well, the thinking was we needed we needed to put money uh, on the table yeah. to make that happen. The United States needed to work with work with these countries, provide resources, financial but also expertise um, and in terms of how do we you know, make sure, first of all, that they comply with all the Soviet era arms control uh, that had been put in place around the nuclear issues, you know, cutting up missiles, blowing up silos, destroying bombers. Um, and those are and kind of the methods of how you deal with it? Or are there others as well? Those are those were the primary methods. I mean, those were the methods that were baked into the arms control agreements was mm -hmm. that that was what you, you, the arms control typically controls delivery systems, right. not the warheads themselves. Right. But we were also very worried about um, the warheads, the nuclear warheads that were in Belarus, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan at the time that the Soviet Union fell apart. And these were countries, it was very important, you know, the number one U.S. policy at that time was to make sure that there was only one nuclear successor state for, to the Soviet Union, that all of those warheads had to go back to Russia, and they had to do it quickly and they needed to do it safely. And so that turned out to be one of the very earliest things we were able to do with the Russians is work with them and their Ministry of Defense to safely and securely uh, you know, move all of those warheads um, on trains from you know, Minsk and you know, outside Minsk and, you know, in the in the black earth country of Ukraine um, and in the steppes of Kazakhstan uh, over millions and millions of, of rail miles to, you know, to make sure that they weren't, uh, you know, harvested by uh, some kind of a terrorist group or some, you know, some separatist group that might attack the train or that there wasn't some kind of an accident because they're moving too quickly or not mm. safely. And so we, the U.S. provided a, a whole lot of safety and security equipment to support that removal. And how how did it all come together so quick? And what, what was the time period they were able to actually move all these materials? Yeah, well, the, that, they were completed in, it was between 1992 and 1995, um, and the um, Ukraine was the last, the, the last stuff to, to leave. Um, but the um, but it was just the Russians were starting even before we started helping them. Mm. But the the way the U.S. got to a point of having the resources and the legal authority to help them was through Senator Sam Nunn and Senator Richard Lugar uh, from each, from different side of the aisle, but both committed to bipartisan, you know, kind of statesmanlike national security. And 
they took the, the research that was being done by Ash Carter and Bill Perry and the team there at Harvard and Stanford and turned it into legislation, wow. which bears their name, the Nunn-Luger legislation, and that became the, the beginnings of, you know, two decades of, uh, and, and, you know, still going. Um, and that, that bill was passed in the fall of, of 1991. And it was being, you know, kind of sort of implemented and some of the early pieces, legal pieces being put into place in the late Bush administration. Um, and then when the Clinton administration came in, Ash Carter came into the Pentagon, Bill Perry came into the Pentagon, a lot of people who had been working on those areas, myself included, went in. And we now had the opportunity to really build the program and really live it out. And so to and have what did that program look like then? Well, at that point, it was $400 million a year, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, decimal dust in Pentagon <laughs> sense, but it was always extremely politically fraught. Mm -hmm. And um, it, not everyone in Congress got on board with the notion of helping Russia was in our security interest as opposed to you I can know, see confronting that Russia. Yeah. That was a very quick spin that a lot in Congress were never able to to make. And so um, what were some of the challenges that you personally faced in help in implementing this plan? Well, getting keeping the money flowing from Congress was a yeah. big part of it and building you know, building a program, you know, it sounds kind of boring and bureaucratic, but building it from the bottom up, like really being it instead of having what what happened in the early days was, you know, President Clinton would go out and he'd make a speech in Kiev and say, "We're going to spend Four hundred, you know, two hundred and forty million dollars over the next three years in Ukraine to help denuclearize Ukraine, and then we'd be back there saying we don't know how to spend two hundred and forty million dollars, and so you're working from the top down, yeah. and that was necessary because you had to put a dramatic number, yep. you had to solidify the the political instinct in these countries to take the steps that we knew they needed to take, um, but over time, if it was going to be more than just a you know a two or three year like crash program, and it turned into a much, you know, couple decades, then you needed to be able to say, okay, next year, here's the stuff that we really need to do. These are the top priority yeah. things. These are the things that are next in line. This is the right sequence of things to do. That's going to cost X amount of money. So we're going to ask Congress for X amount of money. Um, and the program morphed a lot over time. It started out being 100% in the Defense Department, and then Defense Department would send little pockets of money over to the State Department and the Energy Department to do the things that they were good at. Um, and the defense wasn't so good at. Over time, there was a decision made that, no, the State Department was going to budget and ask for its own pot of money to do its things, and the Energy Department was going to ask for its own part, and it, that allowed it to grow from, you know, something like $400 million in the early days to, you know, over $2 billion at its height in, in, the, in the Bush, uh, George, George W. Bush administration. Um, and to really make, you know, be working across a whole range of, you know, nuclear but also biological chemical weapons And then what challenges. was the result of, of this program at the end of the day? How, looking back, how, how did yeah. it turn out? Well, I mean, we did get, you know, a, a single state, a uh, single nuclear state coming out of the breakup. Yeah. Uh, Russia. Um, Which I can only right. imagine the complexity, given the, the current yeah. state of affairs. So say, what if what Ukraine contact? still had nuclear weapons today? Or any of the that you just yeah. mentioned. I mean, there were, what, half a dozen that might have still well, had? Well, there were three countries yes. that out besides Russia that had that had weapons, uh, strategic weapons that could have reached the United States and were only programmed for the West. They weren't, you know, they weren't programmed back at Russia or, you know, programmed right. for Europe. I mean, and these countries weren't, didn't have the wherewithal to actually use these weapons yeah. in any serious way. So um, it was really a matter of security that they be removed so that yeah. they could be properly stored and, and managed and ultimately dismantled inside Russia. But in the end, I'd say so. I say first of all, you know, one, you know, a single, a single nuclear successor state, yeah, top um, priority, yep. major league uh, thing. The other is that Russia continued to comply with all of its strategic arms uh, treaties, um, even in even when they weren't, they didn't have the money to spend on it, yeah. um, and the U.S. was providing resources. the The program didn't write checks to Russians or Ukrainians or Kazakhstanis. It provided assistance in kind and expertise and, you know, services that would mm. be paid for out of accounts in the Pentagon and the State Department and the Energy Department. Um, so it's not like the money could have been diverted because right. there was no money, but there was, you know, assistance and on the ground activity. And that created, you know, not only 
you know, carving up missiles, shutting, shutting, uh, and shutting down factories, closing up, uh, blowing up silos, um, but also locking down nuclear materials, mm. and you know, making sure you know, bringing a more modern approach to how do you secure nuclear materials because the Soviet approach had been all around hiding them and they were all in these secret cities which the the, the populace wasn't even supposed to know about and so wow. they allowed you know underbrush to grow up around them they were often situated in the middle of forests um, they weren't on any normal map um, and their big fear was a NATO attack and so shifting that in a post you, you know first of all, post-Soviet phase, and then secondly, a post-9-11 phase, where you're talking about non-state actors, where you're talking about um, insiders uh, who may be pilfering material and bringing it out, and you know, you come up, you come to a whole different way of thinking about how do you prevent unauthorized access to this material. It's interesting how over time the uh, threat has itself morphed, um, mm. and it's almost like we have to stay constantly vigilant to adapt to the new considerations of each era. Right. And the Cooperative Threat Program was able, the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program was able to do that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it had, uh, they were able to evolve the regular, the, the underlying authorization legislation to expand to new threats, to give new, new uh, authorities to different departments. Um, and so the energy department's budget and activity level went up very high as you know, kind of the big hardware stuff that the defense department was really good at dealing with mm. um, started to get, those jobs started to get done. The energy department, you know, their materials work um, started to become uh, really the, the driver of the program. And particularly after 9-11 when we realized, okay, these are not the terrorists from you know the Red Army Brigade or Abu Nidal or Shining Path mm -hmm. in Peru, these are terrorists who are organized, who are wealthy, who are um, apocalyptic, uh, who say that they are owed you know two to four billion deaths as a compensation for the crimes perpetrated by the Crusaders over the millennia, and so there's only you know a few ways to. Uh, achieve two to four billion deaths right. and that's nuclear is one of them yeah. and you know in the exploitation of the of the caves where some of al-qaeda was was hiding there are some bomb designs that weren't as far off as you would want them to be wow and i didn't know about that so it was a real a, i mean it was and continues to be uh, an enormous concern and so moving from arms control compliance which is what initiated this thinking to uh, secure material, um, and not just secure material in the former Soviet Union, but globally, and to look at, oh, things that we used to think were, you know, kind of normal in nuclear, that, that intersection between nuclear weapons and nuclear energy and nuclear research kind of in the middle there, you, you know, we, we were, we had, we in the Soviets had, had uh, you know, ourselves proliferated, if you will, during the Atoms for Peace program you know, dozens of highly enriched uranium-fueled research reactors all over the world, um, right. never thinking that that could have anything to do with a nuclear bomb. Um, but post 9-11, realizing, oh, that highly enriched uranium, <laughs> that research reactor, it could be, you know, stolen, um, the, the security levels at a university are not, are not high. At MIT, where you and I first met, you know they have a highly enriched uranium research reactor there on campus. <laughs> um, that is, you know, it's had some security upgrades since 9/11, but you know it's mainly the Cambridge Constabulary <laughs> that provides the physical protection for that. Not a, you know, not what we think of as you know the kind of protection that that nuclear weapons have. And this is one of the reasons I was really excited to talk to you today because um, this is no surprise to anyone. I'm a huge advocate for nuclear energy. But um, there is this concern that, that people have, that rightfully have, that we have to take into account as we design systems. And I don't just mean nuclear reactors, but entire mm -hmm. systems around nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. And it can be done where we can mm -hmm. both achieve our non-proliferation goals and our energy goals, but we just have to keep it in mind. And that's why, I mean, your expertise is uh, particularly important. So what came next after 
um, after after that work? Well, I, I worked at the Pentagon for five years on those kinds of programs. I then moved to the Energy Department and worked on a sister program there, focusing on how to get rid of the U.S. and Russian plutonium that was coming out of our nuclear weapons, um, and also uh, uh, some of the issues around the U.S. highly enriched uranium, uh, that then blending that down from our weapons programs and so on. Um, then, as um, I was leaving government in, in 2001, um, I had kind of seen evidence that there was this kind of interesting movement going on among some of my friends who had been formerly at the Energy Department, some of the nuclear-related NGOs, that saying, you know, Ted Turner is starting to get interested in nuclear hmm. issues. And I, the more I heard about it, the more I, then I, re, then I heard that, that Senator Sam Nunn had been brought in to be part of this. And then some of the people that started to be, you know, early on, come of some of the designers, and I was invited to some brainstorming sessions and so on. I'm like, this is going to be cool. I want to be part of this. Mm. Um, and in the end, it was the Nuclear Threat Initiative was launched on January 8th, I think, of 2001. Um, I was scheduled to leave government uh, that month um, with the change, of, with the transition, um, and. I really, really, really wanted to be part of yeah. this nuclear threat initiative thing that was going to be uh, built up. And I was really fortunate um, to be able to come on as one of the founding vice presidents. My issue at that time was focused regionally on the former Soviet Union, the Russia, new independent states. And um, it was really a way to say, OK, well, now we're going to take this non luger concept, this essential notion that you deal with threats through cooperation rather than through conflict. Mm. And we're going to do the private sector version of this. We're going to unshackle ourselves from the federal acquisition regulation, from congressional <laughs> uh, appropriations process, from government lawyers and their cautiousness. And we're going to say, we want to work on those same goals. And in some cases, with some of the same people, both in the US and overseas, but in a way that is more flexible, more creative, uh, more active. Um, and to really be a do tank uh, more than even a think tank. And so it was a, a really both scary and heady time. I mean, Ted Turner had given us uh, at that time at what was valued at $250 million. Um, and, and how did he become interested in this topic himself? Um, you know, he, he has always had a global vision. Yes. Um, and he had... Uh, just before, like a couple years before this, had you know pretty much bailed the U.S. out of our United Nations arrears and created a U.N. foundation uh, in support of the United Nations by writing a personal check. I mean, we were something wow. like thirty million dollars in the hole because of the weird way that the U.S. budgeted for our our dues and. He said, this is crazy. Yeah. The United Nations serves U.S. interests. Yep. Um, and not on a tactical basis, but on a, you know, kind of conceptual basis. And, uh, you know, we should not be the ones that are not paying our dues. Yeah. <laughs> and that really gave him a sense of, you know what? You know, maybe a large private donor can make a difference on these cosmic things that are otherwise really felt to be government responsibilities. Um, and he used to even joke about how he wanted to buy a nuclear weapon so that he could sit at the arms control table and he could say, okay, let's everybody give up our nuclear weapons. Now, that was a joke. But, yeah. but it, it says something about you know, the, the, way he, the way he saw, you know, how, how could you... Wow, so be... both out-of-the-box thinking and a global long-term perspective. Yeah, and, and the financial wherewithal to, to empower people with you know, gravitas and, and reputation like Sam Nunn with history of on the ground performance like me and some of the other folks that were brought in at that time and to really say, okay, let's, let's go change the world. And what were some of the ways in those early days that you guys set out to change the world? I mean, with a, a new mission, a new mandate, a new team, it must have been a little bit of figuring out mm. what to do and how things work, but what were some of the program goals that you guys were able to articulate and carry out over the next few years? Um, yeah, so some of the, I'm now, you know, the issue is how does a, even with that kind of money, it's still 
you know, a very small entity compared with the large amounts of U.S. government money and other government money because, um, you know, at, later that year was 9-11, the, the same year that NTI was founded, and, and so there was an, a tremendous international outpouring of resources a, against this issue. And so the issue is, well, what can, what, what's NTI's niche? What can we bring uniquely? Because it's not just the cash. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things that, that we recognized was this, this challenge that I was mentioning earlier about the highly enriched uranium in research reactors and kind of, you know, civilian institutes globally. And, you know, the Energy Department at the time was looking, they had four or five different programs that were kind of doing different pieces of it, but none of them were being motivated from a national security point of view. They mm. were being motivated from an environmental cleanup point of view or kind of a good housekeeping point of view of we sent the fuel out, so yeah, maybe one day we should get it back. Mm. So they were, it was in different parts of the energy department. Um, and, you know, the, there was this one facility that was outside of um, Belgrade in uh, what, you know, in the former Yugoslavia, what was then Serbia, or by then was Serbia, um, that had, um, memory serves, 80 kilograms of highly enriched uranium wow. in, in fresh fuel. And it was uh, worrying enough that during the bombing of Belgrade, during the, the Balkan War, and where NATO was, was uh, intervening, the Russians, who had provided that material as part of their atoms for peace during the 50s, um, actually called up the United States and said, oh, by the way, that plum orchard outside Belgrade, you really want to stay away from that. Holy moly. And this is after we had mistakenly bombed a building that turned out to be the Chinese embassy. So this was not an, uh, you know, an unimaginable risk. And so I... Uh, had talked to several people in the U.S. government about, you know, what are the obstacles? What is, you know, is anybody looking at this? What is, to, to remove it? Yeah. Um, are there programs? Are there conversations? Is there diplomacy underway and whatever? And at that time, we, um, the U.S. had sanctions on Serbia uh, resulting from the conflicts of the Balkan War. And um, there really wasn't an opportunity for, I mean, there was no kind of way that the U.S. could engage with them, but those sanctions about a year later came off and the people that I talked to you know called me back and like okay so we can have the conversation but mm -hmm. we don't know what the issue is and so I went out there and I met with the head of the lab uh, the research facility I met with their regulator I met with the people in their foreign ministry um, and I met with someone from the IAEA uh, who had been like visiting them and talking to them about the facility and sponsoring some research at the facility. Um, and it turned out that the, that the Serbians weren't all that concerned about the highly enriched uranium, even though it was not in any way well secured. Uh, I mean, when I walked up to the site, I'd, uh, I had a, I don't think it was a taxi, but it was a car, <laughs> <laughs> just like a normal civilian car. When I came up to the site, it had like a toll booth gate that went yeah. and let me in. Um, and nobody checked my papers, nobody wow. like challenged me. Um, I didn't see much in the way of fencing. Um, I mean, I'm sure as, as you got closer to the facility, there was a little bit more of that, but, but still. Um, it was not the way you would wanna protect, you know, three or four bombs worth of material. And so um, I sat down and I, I talked to them and, and they said, you know, the, that HEU is performing fine for us, we may use it in the reactor at some point, but we can't actually run the reactor very well right now because we have this giant overflowing spent fuel pool that has was, was not intended to be, you know, to last for 20 years of storage, but the, you know, when the Soviet Union started to fall apart, they stopped taking back the spent fuel that had been provided. And so it had been accumulating and aging and leaking and it had been repackaged and messed with and so on. This was very low burn up fuel and very high residual enrichment. And, but, but also, you know, some radioactivity yeah. to it. And they had a bunch of, well, actually what the issue was, they had a bunch of HEU mixed in with LEU. So the LEU was, was, was higher burn up. And so it was giving off a lot of radiation, but the, but the, but the highly enriched uranium was not. 
Um, and so, but it was all together in this pool. And wow. so they're like, we have a radiological problem. We yeah. don't have, when we have a spent fuel problem, we don't have a bomb problem. We don't have an HEU problem. And oh, by the way, let me show you these two metal like warehouse things up here that are just like uncharacterized dumps of radiological mess. Uh, some of which had been part of the cleanup post uh, Chernobyl um, that had, you know, as the cloud had come across that part of the world. Um, some of it had been like very carefully labeled and calculated when they had cleaned out the spent fuel pool once. Um, but it was just like this incredible mishmash. They said, these buildings are our problem. Wow. And there was nobody uh, in the U.S. government who was willing to say, well, this radiological problem, you know, this, this radio, radioactive gook is a national security threat. Um, and what NTI was able to do is to say, okay, well, there are different programs in different places. The IAEA has some things that are being done. The, the State Department has a little pot of money for certain types of things. The Energy Department has some funding for some aspects, but not for the whole Megillah. And so we were able to kind of pull together, you know, I and, and with $5 million from NTI to kind of fill in the gaps of what no one else could do and to make a whole coherent package. And we ended up with a, a letter of intent that was signed by seven different entities <laughs> in inside Serbia, the IAEA, US government, NTI, um, that described, you know, the basic steps of what was going to be done that was going to address the Serbians' problems, but from you know NTI's point of view and the U.S. government's point of view, most importantly, get the highly enriched uranium stuff out of there. But if we hadn't been there to like actually find out what the issues were, to do the research on the U.S. government programs in all different corners of the U.S. government, to put you know our kind of you know filler <laughs> into that mix, then that would not have. That material would still be there, and so what? So not only were we able to say, okay, so that's four bombs worth of material that's now gone, um, and back to Russia to be blended down and, and secured. But now there's a model, right? And you know, we we can't afford to do this. You know, NTI can't afford to do this for every thing, but we've now shown that there are different pieces of this puzzle that can be applied to these other things. And a, a year and a half later, the Energy Department set up a program that brought together all of these you know, separate strains um, to a single mission that was focused on nuclear terrorism, not environmental cleanup, not housekeeping, called the Global Threat Reduction Initiative. And that became like the launch pad for dozens of removals for a bunch of security upgrades at facilities that hadn't really normally been understood as proliferation challenges. Wow. And now I see what you mean by do tank, not just <laughs> think tank. Because, I mean, you really got out there, you identified. So, well, just so I, just to paraphrase, so I understand, um, there was, a, th there was a, a, a risk, there was a threat out there, all this bomb material. But uh, the, what the challenge to overcome was convincing the, local, the locals to do something about that. And so there's actually another problem that needed to be identified and solved. And so you were able to come in in a way that no other organization could with their different agendas and different mm -hmm. goals and different um, you know, specific tasks that they could mm -hmm. take on. And you were able to really define and understand the problem, address the problem, and then, like you said, create a model or a template to apply this to all of the mm -hmm. other places, this would be a problem too. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. Oh, it was very exciting. So. Can I close the oh, oh, yeah. blinds? If you want to take a picture, I can show you. We did a little a little mock up of the project. Oh yeah, I'd love to. Let's make sure to do that. <laughs> Let's make sure to do that after. That'd be awesome. Okay. Um, okay. So then, how did this lead to your appointment at the International Atomic Energy Agency? <laughs> well, it um, when so I was at NTI for essentially eight years when President Obama uh, was actually candidate Obama. 
he was talking about nuclear security as a priority. He said he was going to host a summit uh, to just to address it at the highest political levels. Um, he had, as a senator, he had really taken, you know, made made himself an understudy for Senator Luger and had gone on a number of trips to visit some of the facilities that were involved in the Cooperative Threat Reduction oh, Program. I didn't realize that. And so he was already on board with recognizing that this could be a real problem. And um, so it was not a surprise that he was making that he was that interested in it. And then in um, in Mar in April of um, 20, 2009, um, you know, at, right after his soon after his inauguration, his first big foreign policy address, he went to Prague, and he laid down the Prague Agenda, what we subsequently came to call the Prague Agenda. Uh, about his vision of, of a world without nuclear weapons and yeah. what would that consist of. And the, it would, it, in his view, it would consist, it, 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 it had four pieces. Um, one was uh, reducing the number uh, and role of nuclear weapons in U.S. national security, and so that was essentially a, a unilateral and bilateral arms control agenda. Um, it was revitalizing the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and the, the whole mechanism to deal with rogue states. So that was the North Korea and the Iran part of the agenda. There was securing uh, nuclear material around the world, and that was the nuclear terrorism part of the agenda. And then there was developing a new framework for global nuclear energy cooperation, which was the, the peaceful uses uh, part of the agenda. And so um, I was so excited about that. I mean, obviously, I was very interested in going to work for this president who, you know, clearly had such interest in the things that were yeah. animating me. And so I was asked to join the White House in February. I wasn't able to actually take up the, the post until July uh, of 2009. So I didn't have any hand in the Prague agenda speech, <laughs> but I, I recognized it as my marching orders, um, yeah. or at least. Uh, the nuclear security and to a certain degree the nuclear energy piece of it. Um, and so I, I spent seven years at the White House working on the National Security Council, running the four different nuclear security summits, um, dealing with a whole range of weapons of mass destruction issues, looking at WMD terrorism, um, dealt, dealt with the Syria chemical weapons challenge, launched the global health security agenda, which looks at the overlap between bioterrorism and global public health. And just as the Ebola uh, issue was going, so um, I was uh, not bored. <laughs> um, and toward toward the end, you know, the second half of Obama's uh, term, second term, the um, there was a the the U.S. ambassador that was representing us in Vienna uh, to the International Atomic Energy Agency and the other UN agencies there was called back early uh, to. A very senior post at the State Department, and mm. I went to Susan Rice, the National Security Advisor, and I said, "Susan, I said, geeks like me don't get a lot of shot at being an ambassador, um, but this is this is the job I can do." Yeah. Uh, I said, "I've been working closely with the IAEA since my time at the Nuclear Threat Initiative. You know, very much at the White House. Um, I know the mission. I know the people. Um, this is something that I would really like to get a shot at." And she said. Yeah, let's do that. Um, and you know, wow. it took a little longer. It took about a year for me to finally get nominated um, yeah. between vetting and other things, and then another seven months for me to get confirmed. Um, but in uh, July of 2016, I took up post in Vienna as the as the U.S. ambassador, and uh, finally had a chance to make things work on the ground that I had been trying to, you know, kind of pull the strings on from the White House <laughs> and to be on the other end of that of that relationship and saying, okay, well, you know, that's all well and good, Washington, but let me tell you what I'm seeing here on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it was great because I walked in with a lot of a lot of familiarity with a lot of the actors. Several of my fellow ambassadors were people who'd been involved in the nuclear security summit process or people I had met over, you know, as our own careers had, you know, progressed. Um, I knew the leadership at the IAEA really, really well. Um, but I knew a very narrow piece of the IAEA. I mean, I focused mainly on the nuclear security issue. And so there's obviously much more that the IAEA does 
Um, and your role as ambassador, what were the various functions that uh, you were responsible for there? Well, the main thing I was focused on was the year-on deal and making sure that the IAEA had the resources that it needed to carry out its uh, verification roles, um, to be available to answer questions um, from the IAEA in terms of what the U.S. expected, because uh, they were charting new territory. They were verifying things that they had never been asked to verify in any other country. And so they didn't, they, could they there were some places where they could apply, you know, kind of standard safeguards approach, but other places where they had to invent new, new technology or new methods. Um, and so making the U.S. National Laboratory system available to help answer their questions um, as they encountered unexpected things in the course of their role. Um, making sure that the uh, at the political level that, you know, when in a board meeting, you know, at, at some point Iran or one of their protectors or advocates would stand up and say something outrageous <laughs> about the deal and, you know, for us to then be ready to come in and put the packs on the table and, you know, make sure that the, that the counter story was, was also out there. Um, a lot of behind the scenes work. We had a monthly dinner uh, among the, the six ambassadors that were involved, the P5 plus one. Uh, ambassadors and so that was you know to talk about you know the upcoming board meeting or you know things that were going on in in the IAEA schedule and what how we could coordinate to make sure that we were talking to the other countries that needed to be talked to and that we would chime in or support each other on various issues um, a lot of consultations back with Washington um, but not as many as I expected um, so what was the exact relationship then between, or where, so you sit essentially between the IEA mm -hmm. and, and the, the entire U U.S. government. And the entire U.S. government. Yeah. You are the voice. You are the, you are the representative <laughs> well, between our and, country and the rest of the nuclear world. Me and my world. staff. I yeah. mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, although there's a, there's a whole fascinating uh, question in today's modern communications environment where... I wasn't the only voice. I was the formal official voice, hmm. but my counterparts at the State Department and at the NSC all had their own relationships with the IAEA and with senior uh, ambassadors and other officials in Vienna. And so the um, there was a, it, it was important that we have you know we we be very well coordinated. Um, and that we all have trust in each other that if somebody reaches out directly in a way that doesn't involve all of the interested parties, you know, it was important to me that I never be undercut by a and, surprising And how did you decision. manage that? Um, it was a, a mix of, you know, good process and goodwill. Yeah. Um, and people who understood that that was important. I mean, it doesn't do Washington any good if their ambassador is repeatedly shown to be behind the the um, to 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 be a step behind on the policy, um, it uh, so everyone you know at least in principle you know in the big scale has an interest in in that um, and you know just as modern communications make it easy to to um, go live and direct, uh, they also make it easy also for people to get around. Make it yeah. easy f to keep everyone in, loo you know, looped in. I mean, yeah. maybe maybe there's a one-on-one -on -one email. Yeah. Um, but then when the answer comes back, somebody says, "Okay, everybody, you know, so and so had this conversation with this guy at, at the IAEA." So now everyone's up to speed. So it requires trust and and active and intentional behavior by everybody. When you were helping put together this deal. Was there ever a moment that you were just like, I don't know if this is going to come together. I don't know if this is going to happen. Well, let me be clear. I was not involved in negotiating the deal. In fact, I've spent most of my nonproliferation career saying I don't do Iran. Yeah. But I had to learn Iran if I was yeah. going to go to Vienna. So yeah. I, I was on, you know, kind of a consumer of what the deal makers were doing. But I, I, I know them all, and I can tell you they were... There were days uh, that it was clear that they weren't sure they were going to get it done, um, and uh, they, I think, they all uh, had, you know, enormous, appropriately enormous pride that they were able to finally get it done. And every, you know, I've heard, heard some of the war stories, and you know, at every kind of crisis moment, there, you know, one or two 
of you know the U.S. team plays a starring role in you know having the insight or making the contact or you know doing the math or whatever it was yeah. that allowed to kind of push through that that tough spot and you know keep the keep the conversation going and so it really did take a that whole diverse team and not just the team that was sitting there in Vienna and la you know doing the the weeks and weeks of negotiation, but the whole U.S. policy and technical infrastructure that was available in real time, you know, when someone would say, well, I wonder if that would work, and then, you know, send it back, and Oak Ridge and Los Alamos crank away and send the send the information out, yeah. and, you know, it's there if we were, the, the time zone helped <laughs> yeah. um, in uh, allowing the work to proceed 24-7 on the on you know the the technical backup to the policy and and the the scientific negotiations that were happening in Geneva or in Vienna. Wow. Well, I'm sure that the work that you guys all put in and a lot of the problems that you solved are going to come into play again. We're going to keep. We're going to need to. I'm sure this issue will come up again with who knows you know what countries over what period of time. But moving sure. forward into the future is that this future. This won't be the last time that we need to. Um, solve many of the problems that you guys mm -hmm. laid the groundwork for. Well, and some of those people are here at NTI now. I mean, Secretary Moniz is uh, the CEO uh, here at NTI as of last summer. Um, Corey Hinderstein, who worked with uh, Secretary Moniz at the Energy Department, is the Vice President for the Fuel Cycle Group. Um, she and I work closely together on the material security issues, um, and we're all thinking about, okay, well, what does what we learned about Iran tell us about what we might need to be doing in North Korea? Um, and you know, there's a there's a lot that that translates, yeah. and then there's going to be a whole lot that about North Korea that was not even you know considered complexities that weren't even present in the Iran case. I mean, North Korea has you know perhaps as many as sixty actual bombs. Iran had no bombs. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know you just work backward from there, uh, so it's going to be a much more complex thing. Plus, we can't forget the the chemical weapons and the biological weapons programs that are very strong in North Korea, and it's really hard to think that you could reduce the the nuclear threat, you know, to some significantly lower number without also taking on the chemical and biological uh, risks that that are there. And so this line of conversation actually brings us full circle because I mean you, you were here at NTI at the founding mm -hmm. and then after your appointment um, now you're here again mm -hmm. you know solving many of the, the same challenges other than North Korea what are some of the other challenges that the organization looks at well there's a very strong biological weapons program that uh, someone who works for me at the White House is heading up here um, yep. which is great um, on my agenda, uh, one of the things that I really am um, trying to move the way we think and talk about material security from a threat reduction model to a risk management model. Um, mm. And when you think about the example like I shared about the Vincha Institute outside Belgrade, where you really are removing material. And so that material is permanently gone. <laughs> from that facility and so whatever risk that posed at that facility no longer is posed there and so and you know in the nuclear security con summit context we were fond of counting you know how many countries had completely eliminated the highly enriched uranium and yeah. it went from 50 in the 80s to 22 wow. and a huge chunk of that progress was done um, you know during the nuclear security summits process a lot I mean and it was kicked off by the project Vincha effort and so the um, but for the 22 that are left many of those I mean that that includes all of the countries that have nuclear weapons and and so that's you know the US Russia UK France China plus India Pakistan North Korea whatever you believe to be true about Israel mm -hmm. um, the so those so that's nine countries and the um, and they're going to have nuclear materials for the foreseeable future. I mean, as much as I would like to think that we have a hope of taking taking North Korea down, we're certainly you know France and 
and China are nowhere close to walking away from their nuclear weapons. So they're going to have long-term stewardship issues. It's not about threat reduction. It's about risk management. Mm. And a number of other countries have ongoing civilian uses of highly enriched uranium. Germany uses highly enriched uranium in a big research reactor uh, unique in the world um, that uh, is going to be using it, highly enriched uranium for the foreseeable future. So we really need to stop thinking about exclusively about the notion that threat is something that begins and ends <laughs> and and that you reduce it you know in kind of a binary you know you got it or you don't kind of way to the notion that this is an enduring problem uh, that there are that that risks are going to exist whether they're terrorist risks whether there are other kinds of risks that we haven't been able to perceive I mean certainly today it's easy to be worried about Russia returning some of the materials to make, you know, massive amounts of new weapons. We weren't worried about that in the 90s or, you know, even the aughts. Um, so the the risks change, yeah. um, but you your your ability to manage those risks is going to be the hallmark of success. And are, are are we adjusting our thoughts to those shifting risks? Are we thinking about how we deal with the risks over decades or centuries rather than you know the next appropriation or the next nuclear security summit or you know what some kind of a short term goal where you you there's there's always been this theory that you know we want to end the nuclear security work it's like well not until you get all the nuclear material off the planet <laughs> are you going to end that work. And that's not happening in any of our lifetimes. So let's think about how do we set up nuclear security culture? How do we do nuclear security by design in the facility, nuclear facilities that we're building uh, going forward? Energy facilities, weapons facilities, any kind of facilities. And now in, um, in affecting the culture, nuclear energy has actually been a, a key player in how we are able to expose our cult, our safety culture, um, but also forge a, a nuclear relationship and a series of uh, or ongoing nuclear conversations mm -hmm. uh, with any country. So does that come into your thinking here at all? How can we, um, how can we bring nuclear energy to a country so we have that relationship, so the IAEA is present there on an ongoing basis and thus reduce the potential nuclear weapons risk from that country. Does that come into your thinking here at all? It certainly does, and it's it's a part of the mission that's kind of shared between me and my my uh, colleague on the fuel cycle team here. And of course, something that Secretary Moniz has written about, you know, apart from his NTI persona, it's something he's he's been working on for a long time. Um, you know, the the. Going back to Atoms for Peace, U.S. nuclear commerce has been understood within a narrow community as a piece of our nonproliferation strategy. And that's why it was part of President Obama's Prague agenda, even though it was often forgotten. People talked about the three pillars of Prague. I'm like, no, there's four, <laughs> nuclear energy. Um, but it's, you know, when, when the U.S. sells uh, nuclear technology overseas, it comes wrapped in a package called a 123 uh, Agreement for Nuclear Cooperation that contains a number of nonproliferation commitments uh, that the other country, the recipient country, is making. Gives us visibility and access uh, to their nuclear energy, their peaceful nuclear energy program. As you say, it gives us a chance to transfer our high quality security culture, our safety culture, our quality operations culture that um, really helps these these countries utilize nuclear energy in a safe and secure and, and you know economically viable way. Um, it gives us also visibility at the you know kind at of at the ground level at the ground level exactly. Um, whereas where you begin to you know maybe you see someone starting to talk about yeah well you know we might want to move to a fast reactor and a, and a you know, a closed fuel cycle and a breeder mode and, you know, separating plutonium and things that, you know, start to raise alarm bells uh, when you think about, you know, diversion from a civilian program to a military program. Um, you, you become aware of, you know, research that might be done in an associated laboratory 
um, that might be concerning in some way. And so, and you can even see where some of the materials are going. Yeah. And certainly the U.S. requires, I mean, any material that we sell, we have consent rights on its onward transfer to somewhere else. The U.S. has a vote uh, or has, the, has a veto <laughs> on whether or not that's transferred to some other country. Um, we have a veto on whether they change the form of that material, in other words, enrichment or reprocessing. Um, and that applies to all of the material in a country. It's not just the U.S. material. It, it applies to everything. So that's a very key point and there. So, yeah. it's um, So these are very powerful nonproliferation tools. Um, but what's the, the challenge that we face today is that the U.S. doesn't have enough attractive nuclear commerce that make it worthwhile for countries to wrap themselves up in this by, by, complex. And by that you mean we don't have a offering, we don't have a product offering for these countries mm -hmm. that would help us forge that relationship yeah. where then we can have a, a non-proliferation um, role in their future exactly. moving forward. Exactly. We don't have an attractive nuclear offering. And um, I mean, we have offerings. Um, they're meager. Uh, they used to be, you know, we used to dominate. Uh, what, not just Westinghouse, but General Electric, General Atomics, um, combustion engineering. Um, I mean, you. there's a reason the U.S. built so many of the power plants around the world. Um, but, and you know, we still have the largest fleet of nuclear power plants on, in the world, um, even though they're declining <laughs> and not being replaced. Um, the, um, but that's not, this is a wasting asset. Um, and if we don't figure out how to get back in the game on nuclear commerce, uh, we're going to lose those nonproliferation influence tools. And that's why I'm so committed to the advanced reactor opportunity, because that is a place where if we, if we can do it right, um, you, you know, both from a commercial promotion point of view, but also from a national security safeguards by design, security by design, secure fuel cycles. Um, we can really look at the diversity of advanced reactor designs that are being developed in the United States, some of which are, you know, optimized to, you know, electricity production, some to desalination, some to industrial heat, um, some to, you know, load balancing in the context of renewable. I mean, there's, a, there's such a diversity there and that matches really the diversity of, you know, the next wave of nuclear reactors, nuclear energy globally, um, which is not primarily about large gigawatt scale reactors. So maybe it's okay that we're, <laughs> you know, aging out of our, uh, uh, of our uh, dominance in that market, even if it wasn't on purpose. Um, but we've got a new chance and, you know, a, a chance that um, a lot of other countries don't, don't have and where we may well have a, a product that's more appealing. Uh, to a broader number of countries than than even a gigawatt scale uh, light water reactor, but we got to do it right, and we have a chance because most of these reactors are still for the moment power point reactors. Um, we have a chance to do it right. Uh, you can make changes without blowing up your licensing process <laughs> or, you know, just des destroying your your construction schedule. Um, and uh, it's time we it's time we get serious about that. Laura Holgate, thank you so much. Thank you.